please pray with me. Gracious God, we do thank you for all the colors. We thank you for our children who so, so well display those colors to us. We ask that the beautiful, the beautiful colors that you have created in us and created in your, in your universe, God, would shine forth your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to those online. Good morning to those who are here. I want to remind you this morning um, that, and maybe you've heard this, that there are some quotes that are sort of floating out there in the past from like some, from people or organizations. And for a lot of different reasons, those quotes, they just, they kind of don't hold up over time. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, let me give you a couple examples. In 1998, there was a Nobel Prize winning economist who said, by the year 2005 or so, it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. Yeah, it, ouch, that, that, didn't, that didn't turn out so well for him. Um, in 2011, the video rental store Blockbuster, we all remember them, they tweeted out on their official Twitter handle, tell us why you're leaving Netflix. And the top three most creative tweets will win a year's subscription to Blockbuster. The problem was is that Blockbuster went bankrupt less than six months after they tweeted that out. And finally, the big box retailer Best Buy, they took out huge full page ads in newspapers around the country in December of 1999, saying, beware of Y2K and remember to turn your computer off on New Year's Eve 1999. And of course, it turned out the whole Y2K virus thing, it, it really wasn't a thing at all. But there are some other quotes out there from people and organizations in the past, and for a lot of different reasons, these quotes actually do hold up over time. If you go back to ancient Greece, the philosopher Plato said that courage is knowing what not to fear. I mean, that is a timeless truth, to be sure. In a 1996 interview with Vibe magazine, the iconic rap artist Tupac Shakur said, everybody is at war with different things. I'm at war with my own heart sometimes. I, I would doubt that there's a human alive that hasn't felt that truth within them at some point. And finally, in his inauguration speech in 1961, President John F. Kennedy said, so let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness. Civility in politics. I mean, that is something that all Jesus followers, I think, should be able to get on board with. And then there's this parable that Jesus tells in today's gospel passage that we read from Matthew 21. Now, far be it from little old me to suggest that a quote from Jesus Christ hasn't aged well, but what exactly is the timeless truth that's taking place here? And I'm not sure about you, but this happens to me. But the, when I read the Bible, specifically a lot of times the, the teachings of Jesus, I feel like I'm trying to squeeze juice out of a coconut. Do you know this feeling? Right? I mean, like sometimes when you read the Bible, it's just dripping. It's like, like biting into a ripe peach or getting a, a fresh orange right off the tree. But other times, it's like, I got, I got nothing. I get nothing. One of the things that I have learned over the years, though, is that with any teaching of Jesus, to take it out of its context is to miss Jesus' teaching completely or misunderstand him. So perhaps we need to ask, why does Jesus tell this parable to these people in that time. Because think about it, Blockbuster, they made their offer because they thought that streaming movies on the internet, that's, that, that, that's not gonna be a thing. Best Buy, like many, believed that there was gonna be a huge catastrophic, catastrophic computer failure as the calendar turned to the year 2000. JFK, 
took the temperature of the United States and decided to lower it by introducing respect and civility into the political arena. So what is Jesus trying to do with this story? What's going on at the time that Jesus says these words? Well, at that time, just going back one day from what Jesus, when Jesus said this, that's the day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey and a colt. People are laying palm branches on the road and shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Does this sound familiar, right? Palm Sunday. It's just five days before Jesus' execution. This parable that we read this morning is told in the midst of Holy Week. Now, the city of Jerusalem itself is actually under occupation at this time, and it's controlled by the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire is governed by the Caesar. The Caesar has two concerns and two concerns only. Hold on to the power that you have and get more power no matter what you have to do and no matter who you have to step on to do it. You know, you know, if you think about it, things haven't changed all that much. But the religious leaders of the day, they had actually entered into an agreement, an arrangement with the empire. They could keep doing what they were doing, holding services in the temple as long as they swore allegiance to Caesar. And that meant giving money to the Caesar. And in order to do that, they had to charge extra money for the things being sold in the temple. Because remember, when people are coming to the temple, they are coming there to atone for their sins. And in the Hebrew tradition, in order to do that, you had to have the blood of an animal. If you were wealthy, when you got to the temple, you could buy a bull or a ram or maybe a sheep. But if you were poor, all you could afford was like a small bird, like, 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 like a dove. So do you remember the first thing that Jesus does when he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? He goes to the temple because he wants to pray. And as he enters the temple, he flips over the tables of all the money changers, as well as, and I am quoting directly from the Bible here, the seats of those who sold doves. Jesus then quotes Isaiah and Jeremiah and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You are turning it into a den of robbers. Now, don't miss this, friends and church. The text specifically and only mentions doves. And the doves were sold to who? To those who could not afford a larger animal. Jesus is not upset that things are being bought and sold in the temple or in the church. He's upset because the poor are being cheated, that the oppressed are being taken advantage of, and that money is going to those in power. He sees the religious leaders, and he knows that they have sworn allegiance to an empire and to a leader that looks nothing like the kingdom of God. But Jesus is just getting warmed up because then right there in the temple, he starts to heal the sick, the blind, the lame. And these are the people, according to the religious leaders at the time, they weren't even allowed to come into the temple because they were unclean. Like Jesus is breaking rules. He's calling out hypocrisy. And most troubling, he's pointing out to the religious leaders that they have aligned themselves with a movement and a person who aren't moving in a godly direction. He is showing them that they are anti-Christ. And after that, Jesus goes to a friend's house in Bethany for the night, comes back the next day. But this time, the religious leaders are ready for him. And guess what? They're, uh, they're not happy. <laughs> Neither would you, right? I mean, like if somebody walked into your place of worship and started telling you that your religious system was actually disrupting God's kingdom rather than moving in harmony with it, you might have some questions too. And these questions that these religious leaders have for Jesus are basically like, uh, who do you think you are? Like, who, what gives you the right to do these things? So here comes the power structure, like the system, those in authority coming right up to Jesus. And do they address the things that he's brought up, like corruption or mistreatment of the poor and continued oppression by them and the empire? No. No, they pivot. They change the subject. 
They attack the messenger rather than addressing the message. Again, things haven't changed much. And how does Jesus respond? He throws them off their game, tells them a little riddle about John the Baptist, and then he tells them a story, a, a parable. But it's not a complicated parable, especially if you look at it in the context of what we've just, just heard. One son said he was not going to do what his father asked him to do. But then eventually, he did. And then the other son says, yeah, dad, I can do that. But then, didn't. And the religious leaders are like, uh, Jesus, this is, this is kind of easy. The one who did what his, ad, what his dad asked was the first son, even though he said he wouldn't. To which Jesus lets them know, yeah, and guess what? You're the second son. Like, the people you think aren't in line with God's will, they actually are. This is what is known as a first century mic drop. And, it, and this is the timeless truth of this parable here. Jesus reminds the religious leaders back then and us today that God has invited us as God's people to gather together in order to practice a way of life so that it can be lived for the benefit of others and those around us and thereby partnering with God's restorative mission for the world. It is an invitation. And if you say yes, but then align yourself with empires and people who aren't about God's restorative mission for all people, well, then you haven't really accepted God's invitation. And if you say no thanks but then choose to align yourself with a life that feeds into God's agenda for the world, then you have accepted God's invitation. Jesus tells us these stories and these parables in order to teach us how to live. The issue is that a lot of times we, we come up with our own stories to support our actions, don't we? And that's the real trick, isn't it? Perhaps we as Jesus followers, perhaps we ought to simply tell the Jesus stories. Because in the face of everything that is going on today, the world just might be helped with stories that speak truth, such as God's love is for everyone. And God always stands with those who are on the underside of power, the weak, the sick, the poor, the ones for whom the system isn't working. This story, this, this parable that Jesus tells, the invitation is clear. Rather than aligning with empires or political parties or candidates or power structures, we are called to live into the stories that Jesus tells. Amen. phone to read messages. I invite those of you who are not physically present to send him a message. And for those of you here, if you'd like to, text to that number. Thank you for your sermon, Father Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody said, uh, <laughs> somebody said, yeah, Aaron and the coconut, that, 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 that made sense to them, you know, trying to squeeze juice out of a coconut. It's an exercise in futility, really. Things, people never get what the preacher wants them to get. <laughs> If that's what you take away, that Aaron squeezes coconuts, that I'm, I'm fine. That, 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 that's, that's okay. I, I'll, I'll take that. Um, someone, uh, someone asked that they hope I have a copy of the sermon. Uh, I, I do. I can send it to whoever. But it's, it'll also be posted just in its entirety online on our YouTube channel and on, and on Facebook. So that's all the things that have come, come through those so far at this time. So This time, I was thinking of slogans and quotes that the church participates in those types of things too. We have some good quotes and then we have some not so good quotes. Mm. I've been a Christian long enough and have just enough memory to remember one in particular from the mid late eighties. There was a book that was really popular. 88 reasons why the Lord is going to return in 1988. <laughs> 1988. 1988. Yeah. yeah. That was, it was a million seller. And as far as I know, it didn't happen. At least, I hope not, right? We, we, 
we, we all want to see the things that we want to see in the scriptures, you know, and, and that, that, that's always the challenging part for me because I, I'll, I'll be honest, like one of the things that I do struggle with is walking into a passage and going, all right, here's what I think. Let's see if it will confirm for me what I kind of already think. And my best moments are when I try to come to the, the passage just as free as free as possible, which is really difficult. I mean, I'm not even sure I've ever truly had that happen 100%. But those times when I do hear something that hits me in the face and makes me go, wait a minute, I might need to reconsider how I thought about this before. Those are those moments where you're like, it's like biting into a peach and it's just dripping down your chin. And you're like, it's, it's too much. Yeah. No. I got into some different thoughts this time. I get to hear his sermon twice when he preaches. And we live in such a time that it's really hard to have certain conversations because different parties have taken over the ownership of certain words and mm -hmm. phrases, and, and I don't like that. But bear with me. <laughs> I think Jesus was arguing with the religious leaders about who matters. And I know that's, that's a trigger word today. But Jesus was saying, the poor are here, matter. Matter. And I've been in churches where when, when we talk about the words of Jesus about money, then the question is, do rich people matter? And the answer, obviously, is yes. of course. Yes. <laughs> but Jesus, in this context, is saying, these people here matter. And it, it, sometimes it doesn't fit in with our structure, our comfort level. It, it's, it's hard to hear good news when we can't necessarily put ourselves in those shoes because yep. I myself am not a poor person. Um, the, the system's been good to me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm not a millionaire, uh, I'm, you know, uh, but I'm, uh, in comparison to a whole lot of people in this world and even in comparison to a lot of people in this country, I'm, I'm doing just fine. Um, and it's hard to hear good news when there are parts of Jesus' message that might not be specifically aimed at where I am in my current life situation. Um, and so how do I hear that without, as you said, hearing it through the filter of you know, different people or different organizations have taken over those words? So. Well, one thought I had that has stayed the same between the services is this, I was taking a walk the other day and the, this fra another phrase came to my mind, uh, uh, peaceful transition of power. I thought, oh, that's me and Jesus. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, but I fight that quite often. Because just because I became a Christian didn't mean Jesus has authority lived out every day in my life. Mm. Sometimes I fight that. The, when my, in my evangelical days, the preachers often use the illustration of a house, that we've let Jesus enter our house. We've been saved. We've become born again Christ. However, we take certain rooms of the house and lock them so that Jesus doesn't have access. And Jesus often walks around the house mm. and checks the door and knocks or says, Aaron, What's in here? Mm. And Aaron says, never mind, Lord. <laughs> right. That's, that's the dirty closet you, you in the upstairs. You don't need to go in yeah. there. there. There's stuff in here, Jesus, I do not need you to see. And if Christ is his Lord, Jesus can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. that, that brings up to me, because someone was asking about the symbolism of the fig tree that is actually in the context of right before we, we see this, the, this parable. And th that tells me that I think there, there might be those rooms in our, in our heart or in our house that Jesus does need to go in and just go, nope, you know, what, whatever's in that closet, whatever's in that room, no. Like that, that is not fruit producing and it's done. Um, whether, whether you're going to do it or whether you're going to let Jesus do it, uh, up to you. <laughs> um, but boy, oh boy, I, I would like to do it with Jesus myself uh, and stuff. So I hope that the person who mentioned that in the, in the, in the text, but uh, hope that helps. So. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is big. Mm. Mm -hmm.
All right. Thank you all. Thank you.